So we're talking about redemption. Redemption is the core of why we need Jesus. It's true. If you're here this morning and you've been a Christian your whole life, but the scope of your faith has consisted of making sure you're at church early every Sunday for the last 30 years, and that's it, I have a really tough truth to share with you. That's not what it is to be a Christian. It's true. It's not what, it's, what it is to be a Christian. What it is to be a Christian is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And it is impossible to walk in the footsteps of Christ unless your soul is changed. It's the facts. The reality is, is we are born into our human condition. And if you don't believe me that our human condition is flawed and full of challenges, find a three-year-old. Everybody says terrible twos, right? And terrible twos is actually a lie. The reason why everybody says terrible twos is because you make it all the way through year two, and you're like, that wasn't so bad. But then year three hits, and you're like, I should have gotten rid of this. I should have just <laughs> let them off into the wilderness, and they could have figured it out on their own. Because it's the threes that get you. And there's lying and stealing, and they're conniving and sneaky, and they scream and yell at you, and they take all of your life from you. <laughs> but praise the Lord, they're a gift from God. Amen? <laughs> we <laughs> Bless you, young parents. <laughs> so much to look forward to. Here's the deal, though, right? We, we need our condition fixed. It's true. We need our condition fixed. It started a long time ago when we stepped far outside of God's perfect plan for us. And because we've stepped outside of God's perfect plan for us, there's some repair that has to happen, some reconciliation that needs to occur. It's just the reality. And here's the deal. Spoiler alert. We are all in need of redemption. There's not one of us here that is exempt from it. If you think you are, you're not allowed here. What do I mean by that? Well, no perfect people are allowed. Plain and simple. There was one perfect person, and he's the one we endeavor to follow. He's the one whose footsteps we walk in. But nobody else is perfect. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It, it is just the facts of life. As uncomfortable as it may be to realize this, the truth is we need Jesus. We do, plain and simple. And what's beautiful is the, the mess that we often find ourselves in is actually the great equalizer. We are all on the same page. Some of us want to admit it. Some of us can't admit of it. Some of us aren't ready to admit it. But the reality is we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And the only thing that gets hurt in the process of this admission of realizing that we actually need help, that we actually can be better, is our pride. So this morning, I encourage you to choose to take a hold of your pride and then let it go. It doesn't matter. The only thing that's going to get hurt in the process of redemption is your pride. Because your soul will be transformed, your spirit will change, your heart will be healed, your eternity is absolutely and utterly transformed. You have a new destination after you die, and the only thing that gets dealt with in the process is our pride gets put to death. And that's okay. When I, when I was young and ridiculously insecure, my pride kept me in a place of not wanting to deal with my own messes. But the older I get, the realize, well, what do I have to lose? My goodness. It just means, you know, I got to get over myself a little bit. And that's okay. So what do we see about redemption? Redemption in the dictionary, it's defined as this, the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil, okay? Or, number two, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or a clearing of a debt. Our souls are saddled with debt. I was talking to a guy about this a few weeks ago. The reality is, is we have chains upon us or weights upon us that unless we deal with them or offload them or have them taken off of us, we have weights upon our souls that weigh us down. They keep us in captivity. They hold us in bondage, and we aren't able to walk in the freedom that God intended for us. You see, Jesus, he is the one who sets the captives free. Amen? 
He sets the captives free. He breaks the chains that have bound us. Amen? It's true. And there are things in our lives that have bound us, and we don't want to get over it, or we run back to it because better the devil you know. We go back to the very things that once enslaved us because it is more comfortable than the potential unknown of trusting that God can repair our hearts and our souls. But today, I want to encourage you to believe in the power of redemption. Here in this place, we believe in the power of redemption. We believe in the power of reconciliation. Wow. Anybody here ever go through a horrible situation where your relationships have just split apart? I'm sure so many have walked through that. Whether it's a marital relationship, whether it's a relationship with family or friends that were so close to you. There's this tearing that occurs. And on the other side of it, you wonder, can I ever be okay again? Will I ever be the same? On this side of the grave, we will bear the scars of what we experience in life until we receive new bodies on the other side of the grave. The reality is we have marks that show that we've been through things. Maybe those marks come out in our attitudes or our interactions with other people. We don't want to be snappy with somebody, but we're snappy because we've gone through some stuff. We don't want to be angry and harsh, but we become that way because of the things that we have gone through. We, our world walks far outside of the perfect plan that God has for healing and life, and, and not just life, but life in abundance. So, so what does it look like to get back to that? How do we find what it is to experience the fullness of life through redemption. Anybody here ever make a mistake ever in their lives? <laughs> okay, no, we're going to do This is an interactive thing if you haven't figured it out yet. Okay, I know it's a long weekend. Half of you are gone. You're camping, and oh, we got double hands over there. We're just going to practice something because it's good for your soul to admit because I'm going to put my hands up too, maybe even a leg. <laughs> Have you ever made a mistake? It's true. Okay, now we've made mistakes, but then here's the other piece. Have you made a mistake that you're still paying for today? You don't have to raise a hand, but man, when you look at it like that, that that hits home. We've all fallen short. But here's the deal. We believe in the soul-saving, eternity-changing, and life-giving words that Jesus says... When he says this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather that the world might be saved through him. Let this sink in for a second. You might be here today, and maybe you've been a believer for a long time, or maybe you're just checking things out, or maybe you just don't know where you land on any of this, and all of those things are totally fine. But the reality is, is if you are here and you are expecting to be condemned, or you are expecting the pastor to preach a message of condemnation, you're not going to hear that. You see, Jesus deals with our sin so that our lives are transformed, and the gospel is clear through the words of Christ. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then number 17, that's 316. Let's look at 317. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. What do you mean? Pastor, for like 35 years, it's like been fire and brimstone, and that's what my faith is anchored to. But let's read the words of Jesus. It says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather in order that the world might be saved through him. There is opportunity today, whether you have been a Christian for 30 years or you've been considering this whole thing for three minutes, the reality is when you say yes to Jesus, you are saying yes to all of your life changing and transforming. And here's the most beautiful thing, and I want to make sure you get this. Romans 5, 8 says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one might dare to die. 
But Romans 5, 8 says this, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My take on that, and this is my favorite passage, I think, in the scriptures, is this. He loved me at my darkest. He loved you at your darkest. Think about the people in your life. And I'm not talking about the friends, but think about the ones that you do not sit in around, don't want sitting around your Thanksgiving table. Think about them. Think about the ones that you turn away from when you see in the streets. Think about the ones that you don't want to interact with at work. Think about the ones that you are so saddled with frustration and anger towards that you've actually moved away from. Think about these people. I know it's painful to consider, but I want you to just dwell on it for a moment today. The Lord loved those people even in the midst of their chaos. But here's the thing. The Lord loves you right now, today, in this moment, even in the midst of your chaos. How unfathomable is that love? You see, it's that love that actually transforms us, reconciles us, draws us to wanting to lay our hearts and lives down before our Creator. His ways are better than our ways. Now, I I like to think my ways are pretty good. But the reality is, is God's ways are always better. And when I see how God does something, or someone who's way better or smarter than me does something, I'm like, man... My ways are terrible. But I've insulated myself from seeing something better because I'm too scared to admit that maybe I've got it wrong. Today, I want you to know that it's okay that maybe you've got it wrong. It's okay because the only thing that gets hurt in the process is our pride. It's okay to admit that maybe I haven't been doing this quite well. It doesn't matter how old you are. Anybody here have gray hair? All right. It's white. (laughs) Thank you, Gwen. (laughs) When we get older, I'm getting more gray as the days and weeks go by. And as we get older and grayer and go through more life, it becomes harder to admit that perhaps we need to make some changes, right? It's tough. Because we don't want to admit to anybody else that maybe we've got it wrong. And it's especially difficult to go and tell our kids that, hey, you know what? I kind of messed up your life a little bit. (laughs) So we just glaze it all over and pretend it's not there. But there's something beautiful about recognizing that maybe we haven't quite figured it all out yet. We are on a journey and we need to tap into the one who has a better plan than we do. And there's no shame in it. We have to anchor to the work of Jesus, because it's Jesus who redeems our messes. Christ is in the business of redemption, but you know who's not in the business of redemption? Our world around us. Christ is the opposite of what we see in the world. Jesus is actually the opposite of cancel culture. Anybody know what cancel culture is? Oh yeah, half of you do. If you're on Facebook, you totally know what it is. Jesus sees where we have been. He intimately knows the reality of what we've gone through, what we've done, what we've experienced, the hurt that we have possessed, and the hurt that we have caused. He is not a stranger to these things. But still, in spite of this, listen to this, in spite of this, he still chooses to love us at our darkest. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But that is completely opposite to what we see in the world. You see, the world wants you always to be utterly and completely perfect. And if you have done anything wrong at any point in your life or any place in your existence, it will be drawn to the surface and used as fuel against you. We see it in the news everywhere, right? Anytime somebody rises to prominence, look at all the stuff they used to do. Anytime somebody comes to the surface or is recognized for something, did you know who they used to be? Why? Why do we do that? And we demand this level of perfection for everybody around us Yet we are seldom capable of looking inwardly and realizing that we ourselves are just as much of a mess. 
Nobody wants to amen to that. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says this, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God, our creator, reconciled us to him. That means he created a way for us to get back to a relationship with him, to know our creator, to walk with him, to have an intimacy with him. He did that through the work of Christ, and in this, he gave us a ministry. He gave you a ministry. I want you to put up your hand and say, I've got a ministry. I've got a ministry. That's right. Now, here's the deal. What's your ministry? A ministry of reconciliation. That is a difficult cross to bear. Because a few minutes ago, we all remembered the very people that we do not want to be reconciled with. I'm not saying you just have to flip a switch and pretend like it's all okay and and not have some healthy structures or boundaries in your life. I'm not telling you to just be holy morons. But what I am saying is that if we recognize what Jesus has done for us, In turn, we ought to have the compulsion to do the same for others around us. We want to talk about what can change and transform our city and our community, not only our family lives, but the lives of those around us. Meeting people where they are at in spite of what they have done to us. Loving people with an unearthly capacity in spite of the pain that they have caused. How can we do this? We can do this because that very love and that very power has already been applied to you through Jesus Christ himself. And I'm not asking you to just muster it up on your own and I just have to love more. If I can do it right, I'm going to do it right. No. It will bring you to the end of yourself. You're going to realize very keenly that you cannot possess what it takes to love somebody that is so broken. But we're called to. So how do we do that? We do that by saying, Jesus, I need your help. Please break my heart for the ones that you love. Give me your eyes to see the world around me. Thank you for loving me so much that you loved me in my darkest moments. Now please, God, teach me to love others the same way. I like this. It says, Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Listen to this. Not counting their trespasses or sins or past against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. See, culture today, especially in the world we live in, it demands that you pay for everything that you have ever done, no matter when it is, no matter who you were at the time, no matter where it happened. Culture demands that you pay for everything that you have ever done. But Jesus was a cultural revolutionary in addition to also being our Savior. He rebelled against his culture at the time, and I actually believe that if we follow Christ, we are called to something beyond being in our culture. We are called to more than just the status quo. In fact, the calling upon our lives is a higher call. And that doesn't mean that you are better than anybody. What it means is that you recognize, maybe for the first time, that we are in desperate need of help. Because when we receive that help, we then are also able to give that help to others. You see, culture scours your social media. It invades your private life. It catalogs everything that you could have ever stood for or stood against and then puts it on display for the entire world to see so that judgment will befall you, so yet you remain in prison and that the shackles will be tightened up on your life. That is is what the world today demands of all of us. You can't make a mistake. You have to try to hold it together. You have to appear perfect all the time. You have to make sure always that you are constantly on guard. I want to tell you this morning, church, that perfection doesn't come from what you accomplish. Perfection comes from the one who's already accomplished it. Jesus upon the cross, when he died for your sins, he paid the price. 
ultimate price. It was covered. It was dealt with. The blood was shed. The debt was paid. It was paid in full. Then and now and forever. And when you choose to say yes to Christ, you're choosing to say yes to redemption. And what's amazing is that power begins to work in your life as your soul changes, as your heart transforms. But then the beautiful thing is out of an overflowing that same power is applied to the people around you. Culture keeps you a prisoner to your past. Anybody here ever make a mistake? You are not a prisoner to that. And what's crazy is that today you might be thinking about some of the mistakes you've made. And in fact, maybe today in this moment, you're trying really hard not to consider them. Or, or maybe today you're paying the price for the things that you've done. But if you stay anchored to the past of who you were, who you used to be, and you don't accept that Jesus has healed and restored and changed you, you will never move forward. The reality is, is that the world around us, our culture will keep you prisoner to your past. It will cripple you from moving forward in freedom. But Jesus, you see, he is the opposite of cancel culture. It's true. He is the opposite of cancel culture. He meets us exactly where we are at. He loves us at our darkest. And he never leaves us there. In fact, he doesn't count our past against us. Does anybody here have their past ever counted against them? Oh, man, I, I do. I've said some dumb things even up here years ago. <laughs> Praise the Lord that he doesn't count them against me. Now, the reality is I have to repent for it. I got to apologize. I got to make sure I, you know, don't go back to who I used to be. But that doesn't come from my own strength. That comes from allowing Jesus into my heart to fix and repair the mess that used to be me. Our staff knows this. There's James, and then there's James without Jesus. <laughs> and they all know when, I, when I'm acting like James without Jesus. They all know. It's like micromanaging, controlling, like just, uh, just it's, it's not good. It's not a good situation. And, and I, have to, I actually have to choose to put that part of me to death every day. I have to choose. Because if it was up to me, I'd just be like, I'd be on it. I'd be controlling, micromanaging, like in your face and calling you on stuff. It's not, it's not pretty. It's not good. And I don't want to be that way. But that part of me comes from insecurity. That part of me comes from frustrations and angers. That part of me comes from who I used to be. But I'm not that person anymore. And sure, because I'm on this side of the grave, little blips and glimmers come to the surface every once in a while. Of course it does. But overarchingly, when we take a step back and get out from under the microscope and have a 30,000-foot view, what's our trajectory? Is our trajectory towards Christ? If it is, this is a good thing. And we allow him into our situations to minister and to work and to repair. You see, the world that demands that we be ashamed, the world demands that you cannot move on. It says you have to stay in who you used to be. But what does it look like to change? How can you ever get better? How can you ever transform? How can you ever accept life into your situation if you can't change? Sure, I used to be this way. I used to be a druggie. I used to be an addict. I used to be an adulterer. I used to be a murderer. I used to be that, but that is not who I am anymore. Imagine Paul who was once named Saul, who murdered the Christian church in the early Roman reign. Imagine if the church at the time didn't recognize the power of Christ at work in Paul. You see, if, if they counted Paul's past against him, and always everywhere he went said, you were a murderer, you worked for the Roman government, you enslaved the church, you put most of us to death, you drug us to our graves. You can't speak to me, you can't talk to me, you have no influence in my life. Imagine if that was the case. But that wasn't the case. Why? Because Jesus not only transformed the life of Saul, so much so that he actually was given a new name, Paul, but the work and the power of Christ of redemption changed the landscape of the community that once demanded blood for who you used to be and instead granted life because of who you are in Christ. The world demands repentance and retribution but doesn't allow for redemption. 
The world demands repentance and retribution. You have to say sorry to me. You have to show me that you are wrong. You have to pay for what you've done. But what about redemption? What about moving on? What about being made new? Think about the people in your situations, in your lives, the ones that you thought about moments ago. I'm sure you've wanted retribution. I'm sure you've wanted them to repent. But have you started first to pray that they become redeemed? And if that's a foreign concept to consider today for somebody else, why not apply that to yourself this morning? Lord, is it possible that I could be redeemed? You see, Christ is our salvation from who we used to be. Christ is our salvation from the culture. Jesus sets us free from our sins. Through the Son of God, we can know the good that is grace and forgiveness. God saved us through his Son so that we may not only have life, but that we actually have life in abundance. I've said it before in the past, you were built for more than just eating, sleeping, living, and dying. It's true. Now what are you going to do with that? You were built for more than just staying in who you were. Now what are you going to do with that? It says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. The only way that you can lead with power is when you realize that your sins aren't only forgiven, that your past is not only forgiven, but that it's also actually forgotten. God no longer counts it against you because it was erased and washed clean on the cross with Jesus. But so often we stay shackled to who we used to be and it prevents us from moving forward. And even though no one else around us may even demand that of us, we place it upon ourselves every single morning, every single day. We look in the mirror and all we see is who we used to be. We don't remember and recognize that we're actually set free. You have life and life in abundance. Do you live this way? Do you you live in a way that shows your past is not only forgiven but forgotten? Or are you still living shackled to your past? Worship team, I'm going to call you up. If you've been shackled to your past and living in this bondage and stuck in the prison of who you used to be, Believe it or not, today is actually the day, this is your day, that you can be free. It's true. It's actually true. And if you don't believe me, well, you're looking at proof of it. You are looking at proof of what Jesus can do to not only change a life, but change a lineage. And I know that Jesus has changed my eternity I know what I was bound for. I know where I was headed. But I'm not headed there anymore. And if I stayed stuck in who I used to be, I can't move on from this. I'll never be okay. I'll never recover from this. If I stayed stuck in that, I would never be able to move on with life. But God, I know, has more for me than staying stuck in my past. And in order to get free from your past, you have to move beyond it. You have to choose, you have to endeavor to start pursuing who Jesus is. It means that you have to choose today to take a step out of where you used to be and fix your eyes upon Jesus. What does that look like? Man, that means go and find somebody who's a believer, who's got a good life figured out that you can trust and say, hey, How do I share my heart with God? Well, they'll tell you. 
What else do you do? Well, right now, in this moment, you can say, Jesus, I need help. There isn't a special magic prayer that invites Jesus into your life, and then it's done. Every single day, every single moment, starting right now until the day you're in glory, you choose to wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. And not only that, it comes with saying, Jesus, author my footsteps because I've messed it all up. And then with that, it also says, Jesus, please bring people into my life to instruct me and encourage me, help me be nurtured and help me grow. The gospel message of Christ isn't going to feel good to your flesh because who you used to be actually needs to perish. The gospel of Jesus will transform your mind. It will repair your broken heart. It will change your eternity, but it will kill your flesh. It's the truth. It's an uncomfortable truth that we have to wrestle with, but are we willing to move beyond who we used to be? I know that who we used to be so defined us, and we tell the stories and we go back to it, but who are you now? Who will you be when your life is changed? Are you willing to step beyond the grave that you have been in and have life because of what Jesus has done? Are you willing to make that change today? If you've been shackled by your past, living in bondage and stuck in this prison, it is time to be set free. Right now, the power of God is meeting you where you're at. Some of you have been coming to the church for a long time, but you've never actually met Jesus. I'll tell you a secret. This building isn't where Jesus lives. Maybe you've been coming to a building thinking that that's how you meet Jesus. But it's not true. I'm sorry if anybody has ever taught you that lie. It is not true. It is not true. The way you meet Jesus is crying on the floor of your bathroom. The way you meet Jesus is when you say, I can't keep putting needles in my arm and expect to live tomorrow. The way that you meet Jesus is choosing to call out and say, I need help because who I am isn't fixing this anymore. The way you meet Jesus is saying, I have messed up and I am broken and I can't do this by myself. The way that you meet Jesus is you take a step into the beauty of his creation and you admire his handiwork and remember that he has built that for you to experience and enjoy. The way that you meet Jesus is when you invite somebody into your life, into the mess, into the turmoil, into the chaos, and you share maybe for the first time that you've been believing a lie. The way that you meet Jesus is when you come to the end of yourself. And it is the hardest thing to do. Some of us do it moments before we die. Others figure it out a little bit before. But I implore you this morning, don't wait. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands this morning. I'm not going to ask you to say a special prayer. What I will ask you to do is wherever you are at, whether you're joining us online, whether you're joining us across the world, wherever you are at, whatever your situation is, I encourage you this morning to say, Jesus, I need your help. Because when we say those words, we admit that we can no longer do it on our own. And the truth is we can't. We can't love the unlovable. We can't repair broken souls. We can't even manage to fix our own circumstances, let alone somebody else's. So how do we move on? We reach out and we reach up. We reach out to the ones that God has placed in our lives and we reach up to Christ who has restored our souls. 
and we simply say, Jesus, I need you. So why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Philippians 3, 13 to 14 says this. And this is Paul. And I love this because he's just being frank about the reality of where he's at. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have figured it all out yet. But one thing I do is today I choose to forget what is behind and I reach forward to what is ahead and I pursue as my goal the prize that is promised by God in Christ Jesus. There is promise of life for you and it is beyond this and it is good and it is holy and it is righteous and it is pure. And that very beautiful gift that is promised to us through Jesus is for you today. So finally, remember who made you. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. You were stitched, knitted together, and formed in your mother's womb. You are not an embarrassment. You are not a screw up. You are not a lost cause. You are not irredeemable. You are not who you used to be. You are not defined by what you have done. Your future isn't dependent upon your past. But what you are is you are forgiven. It's true, you are forgiven. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter how much you've messed it all up in the past, today you are forgiven. You are redeemed. Right now, you are set free from the very things that once bound you. The debt of your soul has been paid through the sacrifice of Jesus and you not only have life, but you have life in abundance. And today is the day to take a hold of that. Let's pray and then we're going to close in worship. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much this morning for the gift that you have given us to reconcile man to you. The gift you've given us of your son Jesus. Heavenly Father, I just want to speak on everyone's behalf this morning and say, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. I'm sorry for the things that I've done. I thank you that you've met me where I'm at. I thank you that in the depths of my chaos and disaster, you still loved me. Give me that love for others. God, give us, your church, that love for others. The same compassion that you've had upon us, give us that compassion for others. I thank you that we are new creations in Christ. This morning, God, we give our hearts and our lives to you. We surrender to you. We put our pride down and we lay it at your feet. And we say, not my will, but may your will be done. Amen.